Today, my talk, so that I, as I explained just earlier, informally, my, the, the title of the talk has narrowed down a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about, uh, about uh, the energetics that much of earthquakes, but uh, I'm going to concentrate today on the role of fluids in the dynamics of faulting in the crust. And uh, it's really heavily laboratory oriented, uh, uh, as you're going to see uh, shortly. So this work uh, is not just my work, obviously, it's, uh, uh, it's a long story of collaborative work. And I would like to highlight the contribution of uh, Franz Aben, who's, uh, who's now working at TNO in the Netherlands, who's been the main postdoc working on these problems for the past, I think he worked with me for like four or five years on and off. And also other people, uh, Bobby Elzegood, the PhD student who's just finished, Dong Liu, Emmanuel David, Tom Mitchell, and Phil Meredith. It's a proud picture of France uh, uh, in the lab uh, while running a test. So uh, funding came from uh, the Natural Environmental Re Environments Research Council and ERC. So I have a very long introduction. Uh, I hope that it's not going to be too long and not too easy. Uh, but I thought I would kind of uh, set the scene uh, uh, maybe take the time actually to uh, to introduce the, the different aspects of the problem and go quite slowly there and then have a lot of experimental observations to show some upscaling. It's very simple upscaling, but uh, it's some, essentially some theoretical uh, some theoretical work I've, I've done based on my experimental observations and then some conclusions. So I'm not going to insult your intelligence by recording all the details of that, but if I want to think about the seismic cycle, I think it's useful to think in terms of of three main ingredients we need to have a, to have a fault sliding in, in, in the earth, actually, or anywhere, actually. Uh, we need an external loading that can be a tectonic loading or it can be anthropogenic loading when you have injection or something like this. We need to have some, so essentially that would matter, that would uh, set the boundary conditions for our problem, whether it's a uh, imposed load or imposed displacements at the, at the edge of a, of, a, of a sliding block. We need to have a, a property that's on the fault uh, that we can call friction if we want, that's essentially something that will happen in a very narrow region concentrated where uh, the slip is going to happen, the shear is concentrated. And we need to understand the properties of the surrounding medium. So we have something in between the fault and our boundary condition, and that's the, that's the, the rock, right? And for uh, as far as the seismic cycle is concerned, one of the main properties that we are interested in is the elasticity of the surrounding medium. If you don't have elasticity, we don't have uh, earthquakes, we don't have waves. Um, now, one way to think about earthquakes, I mean, in, in, in the lab, actually, it's a very useful way uh, or is, is to think about stick slip, right? Slip on fault is really governed by something as simple as stress equals strength. So strength is the, my local constitutive property. Uh, typically, in a case of, of faults, we would say that strength is something like a friction coefficient times the normal stress minus the pore pressure. And that would be an unfold property. And the strength is, some, is, a, is a local constitutive property of the material. We have, to, uh, we have to get it from experiments. We can't really predict it. Uh, now, stress is everything that everything else, right? It's, it's, it's the boundary condition and all the non-local elastodynamic or elastostatic interactions that are due to slip. And that, has, uh, that implies, uh, that involves, sorry, of fault properties like elasticity of the surrounding medium and the structure of the surrounding medium too. Now that's that vision of of, uh, of slip on faults, so stress equals strength, is very useful in the lab when we have small samples. When all the stress aspect is actually uh, quite easy to understand, we have like a zero dimensional system, like a spring slider. That's a really good model. Now the problem is that strength in general is, is typically hard to define properly, right? Uh, what is this friction coefficient? I mean, there's been a, there's a long history of trying to understand friction coefficient. I mean, rate and set friction is, uh, is, uh, is one of the main ideas that, that, that help us understand what is, what is the strength, what is the constitutive property. Uh, but it involves a lot of phenomena, sometimes unconstrained or poorly constrained physics and chemistry, especially when fault uh, sleep fast. We have heating, we have effect of fluids, we have effect of the chemical bonds between the different minerals, and it's very, very hard to predict. Uh, or to make sense of in, in, in many circumstances. Now, a better way of looking at, uh, at sleep on fault is not this kind of zero dimensional way, it's to, it's to think in terms of, of energy balance, right? Where we're gonna, say, we're gonna say that the fault is gonna slide or the fault is gonna propagate when we have enough available elastic energy in the system to match the, what's absorbed by the increment of fault length. So that's, a, that's an energy balance where we have two main ingredients now that are, that are the fracture energy, 
commonly called GC. It's a long debate uh, whether we should call this this or that. But in that context, I'm going to stick to fractional energy because this is the actual definition. It is simply the dissipated energy to advance the rupture tip. The great thing about fractional energy is that the details don't matter. We don't need to know every detail about friction coefficient and everything. We just need to know on the, the, uh, an integrated quantity of how much energy was needed to make this progress, and that's all we need. And it's still a local quantity, it's still a constitutive property, if you want, and that's local to the, to the material. And the available elastic energy is uh, sometimes called energy release rate, uh, that's the G, uh, and that's the stored elastic cell energy that is released by the crack advance. Uh, now, again, GC includes both on and off full dissipation as long as it's near the, 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 the rupture tip. So it's still a local quantity, and G is the non local quantity that depends on the off fault elastic moduli in the volume surrounding the fault and so on. Uh, so you see, it's a nice distinction, and I think it's a bit better. I think uh, I'm, I'm going to touch upon the, the idea of G equals GC when I talk about upscaling the observations in the lab. Uh, but that's a very generic way of looking at it, of looking at the fault propagation and slip in, in the crust. So if you want a, a, a cartoon of what, what this means is that you have the fault, uh, a slipping patch and at the tip, uh, this is where all the action happens, this is where all the friction is changing, or friction, whatever that means, you know, all the, all the energy dissipated, and then essentially you, you take elastic energy in the system, you put it, you dissipate it at the tip and you make the fault progress. Um, now, this is the theory. This is, uh, uh, in a way, this was linear elastic fracture mechanics. It's a very nice theory. It works really well in the lab, uh, but faults are complicated, uh, and earthquakes occur on faults that are complicated. So we can't just simplify it so much all the time. It's a classic picture of San Andreas fault. Uh, I never know which section that is. I think it's in the Mojave Desert. Uh, it's a nice Google Earth image. You can see uh, the yeah, super large scale tectonics here. And if you look at the structure of faults, uh, when faults start, they have to you have to grow from intact materials or like uh, damaged materials, and you see this the, the faults themselves uh, start from these very very complicated micro cracks or mesoscale cracks that link up. This is a nice on uh, series of, of of tensile cracks uh, that it took from uh, Schultz's book. Uh, that's when you have very little slip uh, across the across a fault, but then if you if you slide more, uh, then we generate these cataclysms. Uh, you have like uh, lots of grain size reduction and things like this. So the fault themselves are kind of complicated. And the main ingredient that I haven't touched upon so far too much is the fact that in the crust, uh, fluids are pretty much there all the time. Everywhere you look, you have see some, some, some fluids. And, uh, and the main effect that we'll discuss today is the physical effect of fluids through the fluid pressure. So a fluid can be anything, it's typically water, but it can be also CO2, it can be also helium, you name it. Uh, and the, 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 the strongest effect of fluids uh, on strength is that an increase in fluid pressure will reduce the effective normal stress applied on the fault and it reduces strength. Vice versa, if you, if you decrease fluid pressure, the strength, the frictional strength uh, decrease, uh, increases, sorry. And you can see that you can visualize this effect of fluid pressure, both in terms of the strength, if you want, to, if you insist on, on, on describing it this way with a friction coefficient and a normal stress, but also in terms of fracture energy, because you can show that fracture energy uh, can be a recast in terms of an integral of this strength over some slip. So if the strength is impacted, the fracture energy will be impacted too. So pore pressure variations have an impact on the strength and fracture energy. So that we, we expect them to have an impact on the dynamics of ruptures. And we see evidence in the field of fluctuations of fluid pressure uh, during the seismic cycle. So I'm, I just uh, took a screenshot of a, of a paper that I would like to say is recent, but it's not that recent, it's 2013. It's actually 10 years old. Uh, it sounds recent to me, but it's not. Where essentially these, uh, these authors have found uh, um, uh, evidence or indirect evidence that uh, during earthquakes, uh, you have tensile crack opening and massive depressurization of pre-existing fluids that that can that can and, and the pressure can decrease down to zero. Essentially, you vaporize the fluid, and so they 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 argue in that paper that this flash vaporization process that could happen during earthquakes could lead to uh, um, um, to rapid deposition of minerals in in cracks. So this is a uh, you have many other uh, many other papers that have argued for this, but um, this is a nice example of that. Uh, this is a picture from their paper. 
uh, where they have these massive uh, quartz veins, and they've argued that these quartz veins have been they have been formed during one single uh, fracture event or a series of fracture of dynamic fracture events in which during which the, uh, the the pore pressure dropped to zero and vaporized. So we have indirect evidence in the field that this, this, we have very large fluctuations of fluid pressure uh, on on active faults, and. The main effect I've just described qualitatively this way is what we call dilatancy. Uh, so if I take this kind of cartoon of a, of a, of a fault where we have a crack tip, uh, where we start having some linkage between different micro cracks, and then as we increase the slip along that fracture, then these micro cracks link up and you generate some kind of gouge in the end, uh, uh, we see that to, to generate the fault in the first place, or even to slide on a pre-existing fault, very often you need to open spaces, right? Uh, uh, so during shear deformation, we do have fracture opening. We have overriding asperities that generate cavities. We have granular rearrangements uh, in the gouge, and uh, which means that if you generate more pore volume, then under undrained conditions, we would expect a pore pressure drop. And this is exactly what I've just, what I described qualitatively above. Is that this we expect this pore pressure drop uh, under undrained conditions, and again by the nature of the effective friction law, we would expect some hardening. So that's well known uh, in terms of the qualitative aspects of that. Uh, but the key questions are that uh, we have this major coupling between fluids and faulting, and we still don't know, I mean, uh, how efficient this dilatancy process is, is, uh, uh, is and how it impacts on full fluid pressure in, in a real in situ conditions, right? Uh, and we also don't really know how pore pressure is distributed before, during, and after faulting, because we have this sequence of processes, if I go back to this, from generating these small micro cracks to linking these cracks and then sliding. And we may have dilatancy there. We may have compaction at another stages. At another stage, we may have fluid flow from the outside of the fault to the inside of the fault. And most of that you can model, but you don't really know. You haven't measured it. And down the line, we want to know what is the impact of pore pressure changes on the fault dynamics. So if we take these, these elementary processes and put them together in a fault model, Will this impact significantly uh, the dynamics and the energy budget? So, how in terms of let's say the factory energy, for instance. So, uh, when I started working on this, this was like 2018, something like this, 2017, 2018. There was a lot of prior work. Uh, I can't mention everything, obviously, but I will mention a few key papers, theoretical papers, obviously. And as usual in this business, there's a paper by Jim Rice on it. Uh, uh, 1973 is fairly less known than others where I actually showed that dilatancy could increase uh, effective uh, shear toughness of, of fractures. And later on, we have a few papers uh, by John Winnicki, uh, Paul Segal and Jim Rice and others as well, where they showed that uh, dilatancy could promote stable slip. So these were all nice theoretical predictions. And then in parallel or intertwined with these, uh, with these papers, we had a long series, a long tradition of experiments where people have shown indirect, I would say indirect evidence of dilatancy hardening and rupture stabilization, uh, where essentially people would run these experiments or the different pore pressure conditions and see that when pore pressure is, uh, is high, you would tend to have slower ruptures appearing at, low, at higher stresses. So these were, I would say, indirect evidence of, of, of this effect. Uh, and in parallel, there's a huge amount, of, not huge, but a significant amount of work, uh, uh, people measuring uh, pore volume changes during friction in gouge. I think the, the earlier reference I could find, again, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, is Morrow and Bayerly. And in most, most, I guess, in parallel, Chris, you did this in 1990. And then some, many people took over this. You had a student. That's a long time ago now. That's 14 years ago now. John Samuelson did this in 2009 as well. And again, from there on, there's been a long tradition of doing that. So that being said, we have all these nice theory and these nice experiments. But the, the link between the two is that you would measure pore volume changes during your experiments during typically quasi-static tests, and then you would have to model pore pressure changes. You don't have access to direct measurements. But the thing is that these, these, these predictions, these modern uh, variations in pore pressure changes, uh, pore pressure, are very sensitive to details. They are very sensitive to how the pore volume change during the slip, uh, the sequence of that, and also some key parameters. And I would mention one here is the fault compressibility. So it's a hydromechanical property of the fault, which essentially tells you for a given pore volume change, how much pore pressure will, will, will change? And that's a, that's a quantity that's very hard to measure. So I think to make further progress here at the time, I thought we would need to make, to make direct measurements of pore pressure during sleep under crustal conditions. Uh, 
And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So it's a summary of, uh, I would say, four years of work. Uh, we started, I think, 2018, 2017. So I'm going to move on to experimental observations. And the key aspects of these experiments that we've developed in UCL is that we needed to have a new technology to measure the fluid pressure in situ during our experiments, to have direct measurements and not rely on models or anything like this. So we set up to develop uh, low-cost transducers. It's a strain gauge uh, transducer uh, that's very small. As you see, this is a diameter of 12 millimeters. You see the sensor from the top. And uh, for, the, for the fans of strain gauges, um, you can see this is a diaphragm strain gauge. So it's a full bridge. You measure tangential strain, radial strain, and essentially you make the difference between the two and you sense essentially, uh, you sense the, 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 the small elastic distortion of this, uh, of this little thin metal plate that is in contact with uh, the pore pressure on one side with the rock and the confining pressure on the other side with your triaxial uh, cell. And that's essentially a differential pressure transducer that you have inside your, your triax machine. So this worked really well. So this is a typical calibration test. I'm not going to go too deep in the technicalities, but I thought it was nice to show on this long format type talk. Um, this is a bridge output. Uh, so it's a voltage you would measure on, on, your, on your amplified transducer versus the difference between confining and pore pressure in the, in the pressure vessel. And you see that regardless of the combination of pore pressure, confining pressure, you have a nice straight line over, like, over maybe up to 80 MPa range in terms of uh, differential pressure. That being said, you have an extreme sensitivity. So if you do small oscillations in, in differential pressure, you have a very nice uh, clear signal in the bridge output, which means you have a resolution of uh, less than a bar. Actually, it's probably like a tenth of a bar, something like this uh, in these transducers. I mean, this is not all as, uh, always that easy to interpret. You have like the transducer adds some small volume that you have to correct for. But in the end, it's, it's, a, it's a major step forward measuring things in situ, uh, especially when the, the rock is a bit more permeable. Uh, it, it works really well, it's very efficient. So the idea is that we would, we would do triaxial deformation experiments. We use westerly granite because the whole earth is made of westerly granite. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to measure the pore pressure on the fault. Obviously, if you start, start from an intact rock, you don't know where the fault is going to be. So what you do is you notch the sample. So this is a full scale sample. There's no scale in this, apologies. This is a 10 centimeter long uh, core and four centimeter wide uh, uh, yeah, uh, cylindrical sample. And we notch the sample with an angle of 30 degrees to essentially force the fault to be where we want it to be. And then we would, we would uh, position our sensors. So here we have an, an illustration where we have two sensors on, on the fault at different locations here. Uh, uh, where essentially we would hope to measure the pore pressure variations on that fold during its during sliding and during its generation. Um, we also have a set of acoustic emission transducers. So in, in some experiments, we also combine it with acoustic emission imaging and we would run experiments. So basic triaxial deformation experiments, uh, keeping the same effective pressure. So we chose 40 MPa because it was convenient for us. Uh, there's a, no, it's not made of olivine. No, no, the earth is made of westerly granite. All the top, sorry, this is a silly question from a, <laughs> from, from a troll uh, in the chat. Yeah, uh, no, bridge manite actually, is, the earth is made of bridge manite mostly. Anyway, uh, joke apart. So we have the same effective pressure, 40 MPa, and we say effective pressure is the Terzaghi effective pressure. We're not going to go into anything complicated here, the difference between confining and pore pressure. But then we would change the combinations. We would have like maybe, 60 MPa confining pressure, 20 MPa fluid pressure, or 120 MPa confining pressure and 80 MPa fluid pressure. So then we can play with the different quantities and see if we have any differences. We have on and off pressure, pressure measurements and we monitor acoustic emissions. So to visualize an example of, of, uh, of, of experimental results uh, where we set in that case a fairly low pore pressure, 20 megapascal, and we had a confining pressure of 60 megapascal. The top uh, plot is the shear stress resolved on the, on the full plane. Uh, the middle plot is the pore pressure in megapascals, and bottom plot is the slip in millimeters, uh, essentially like the, the shortening projected into the full plane. And this is time in the x-axis. So if you, this is a classic uh, rupture test where you have a shear stress that you, have a, you start to have some kind of weakening. This is a very small scale here, we have 100 seconds. And then at some stage, uh, we reach a, a rupture point where uh, 
the shear stress drops almost instantly to the scale of this measurement, which is done at one hertz. So between these two points, you have only one second. And then the stress drops by about 100, 100 MPA. Uh, the slip, there's a huge step in slip from about yeah, 0 0.2 millimeters up to two millimeters. And then it slip doesn't stop everything. And then before we had the rupture, we see a small decrease in pore pressure. But what's important to note is that the transducer that was on the fault in black here dropped to zero during failure and stayed there for several minutes after failure. A transducer that was off the fault didn't drop instantly at failure. It dropped over a fairly long time scale. You can see the difference in time scales. So here we have resolved in a, in, in a, at the scale of a few seconds, the variations, the huge pressure gradient we may have during rupture. We have on the fault zero, which means the, 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 the fluid was vapor. So we have we boiled the water at room temperature because we vacuumed it by generating lots of voids. And of the fault, obviously nothing like that happened, but we have internal redistribution of fluids over time because we keep uh, our boundary condition at 20 MPA and so things re-equilibrate over time. So this was the first direct evidence of complete, uh, of, I mean, large variations of, uh, of, uh, of fluid pressure during failure. We have like a 20 MPA drop in, a, in, a, in less than a second. Nicholas, it's yeah. Chris. Can you just go back and show us those two transducers that you showed us a, a couple of slides ago? They looked like they were both on the fault, right? Yeah, this or is no? this is the wrong picture for that experiment. Yeah, okay, okay. That, that's fine. Yeah, this is a, this was an illustration. In that case, we had also had one that was off. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, this yeah, this was for illustrative purpose. Apologies. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that was an illustration of what happens when you have like you start from a fairly low pore pressure, 20 MPA, and this was dynamic. I mean, you heard it. I mean. If you, were, if you had been there, you would have heard a huge bang and a classic you know, a stress drop. Now, if you do the same experiment, same effective stress, but you start at 120 MPA confining pressure and 80 MPA pore pressure, what you see is quite different. Uh, same plots, shear stress, pore pressure, slip as a function of time. You see the, the, the shear stress, so there's no uh, dashed line here because we could monitor everything. So the, the stress drop occurred over uh, a few seconds. So it was not half a second. It was like 10 seconds, let's say. I'm not sure the details of this specific experiment, but it was like clearly measurable over the time scale of, uh, I mean, over many samples in our sampling rate. Uh, the slip also had a step, but then it, it kind of slipped in two, two, uh, two steps. We had a very fast first step and then a long tail here where like the slip continues. Same here, the stress drop is fast initially and then continues after, uh, after if you want the main event. Now the pore pressure didn't do the same thing. We had a first slight increase precursor to failure. And then at failure, we have a very fast drop on the fault. Again, black line is on the fault, the gray lines are off the fault. But then it, it didn't go to zero and it bounced back immediately. So if I zoom on that, on that part, we have a very dramatic acceleration in pore pressure drop. It doesn't drop to zero. It stays, I think here it dropped down to about, if I'm not mistaken, about 30 MPA. So we went from 80 to 30. So we dropped 50 MPA pore pressure uh, in a few seconds, but then as soon as this was finished, uh, the unfold pore pressure bounced back. Again, that's diffusion. Uh, and off fault also was very similar to before. Uh, we had a very slow drop and it takes time for the off fault pore pressure to sense anything because it takes time for the fluid pressure to equilibrate across from the fault to the off fault region. And this was a silent, uh, silent rupture. I mean, if you do this in the lab, you don't hear anything. Uh, you may hear acoustic emissions, but that's not you that's hearing it. You don't have, a, you don't have like a macroscopic uh, dynamic uh, uh, motion of the fault as you would have when you do the low pore pressure one. So if I want to understand unwavingly uh, what happens there, it's useful to go back to our spring slider analogy, uh, which works really well in the lab. We have stress equals strength. Stress is what we apply. This is the piston in the machine. We apply this through, through the piston, actually. So the piston is like a spring, uh, which we load. And the strength is whatever happens on the fault. And here, what I, what I write down here is the friction coefficient on the fault. The pore pressure that's on the fault is non, the pressure is non-uniform. So we have to be careful where we take that pore pressure. And maybe we have some cohesion because it's an intact material to start with. So if we don't have fluids, we clearly see that we have an acceleration and, and a dynamic stress drop. Essentially, at some stage, what the stress we apply is greater than the strength. The strength drops quicker than what the, the, the spring can take. And so it accelerates and it becomes dynamic. That's the classic spring cellar instability. 
But when we have fluids, one of two things happen. Uh, um, the fault dilates, the pore pressure drops, the strength increases, and then it means that we can maintain the force balance and limit the acceleration temporarily by that mechanism, right? So that's, that's a stabilization effect that we see directly. Um, however, if there's not enough pore pressure, essentially, if you drop it to zero, you can't go minus, you can't go to negative pore pressure. It doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, so you, 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 you essentially boil whatever, I mean, vaporize whatever fluid that is there, but you can't keep that strengthening effect because pore pressure is now zero. You've hit the zero lower bound. And so it, com it comes back to being a dry rock. And then if you have an imbalance, then it accelerates. So this is exactly what happened in these experiments. If you start from low pore pressure, then you have only 20 MPA to drop. And if you drop, if you want to drop 50, but you have 20, then at some stage you hit zero, it boils, and then it becomes like a dry material. And then no stabilization is possible. So, okay, that's the horn waving aspect of doing this, uh, which is satisfying to some degree, but I'm not gonna do, give you the equations, but you can solve this problem um, more, uh, more quantitatively. Uh, by essentially uh, combining uh, conservation laws. So we have um, fluid mass conservation from on the fault to off the fault. We have in stress equilibrium uh, uh, across our fault with a spring that, that is our machine and the fault that is our rock sample. And then we have to assume an effective stress law and some kind of uh, frictional weakening of the material. And we know that we have to have some a priori knowledge of how the friction drops as a function of slip or how the cohesion drops as a function of slip in a dry material, right? Otherwise, it, nothing happened. And by doing that, uh, we can calibrate all our parameters based on dry experiments. And we can fit only one parameter for this to, uh, to, to work. It's the compressibility of the fault. So again, something that tells you for a given value of the, of the pore volume change, what would be the pore pressure change? And by doing that, you can simulate the slip rates, acceleration, and deceleration that you have in the, in, in the material uh, and match it with the observed, uh, observed variation. And concurrently, what you can do is also check that this is correct by checking the pore pressure change as a function of time. Uh, and you can see that we can also match to a very satisfying degree, at least the initial pore pressure drop and the, and the minimum pore pressure change, I mean, the maximum pore pressure change, sorry, during this experiment. And then the rebound is not modeled appropriately by our, by our code for uh, because it's very hard to do uh, to do the I mean because the free flow in the, in the actual experiment is actually three D, and the three dimensional aspect makes it a bit more difficult to match. Uh, but essentially, to a very satisfying degree, we can make predictions about what happens just based on very basic effective stress law, and uh, fitting the, uh, the the compressibility of of the full zone material that we need to convert from pore volume change to pore pressure change. So that's one of the main uh, observations we had in this uh, in this series of tests. But then we can we can dive a bit deeper into the different sequences of what we see because I I, I brushed some things on the carpet by saying well before failure we had this kind of drop and so on, but we can we can actually analyze what exactly happened before failure. So if you go into more detail there, uh, what we did is we did acoustic emission monitoring, uh, where we could locate the acoustic emission events during uh, as a time series during the uh, the, the experiment. And what I'm showing you here is an experiment that, that underwent a stabilized failure, but I'm showing you the stress, pore pressure change, and slip. In that case, we call it equivalent slip because the fault is not complete at this stage. It's like it's still half intact rock, so we can't really call it slip, but still, you can project the shortening onto the prospective fault plane and call it some kind of equivalent slip as a function of time during that experiment. And you see that before the main stress drop, look at the scale here, we have like we just around 200 MPA, we have a very small stress drops, a few MPAs here. Uh, and these correspond to, uh, uh, in the sequence of the dots where we show the projection of the acoustic emission location uh, in that uh, prospective fault plane in the ellipse, you see that the fault starts and it's not complete at this stage, but you have a small stress drop that corresponds to a small progress of the fault. And then what we see is that we had, in that case, we had the two we had two sensors that were on the fault. So, uh, the light blue one was uh, roughly in the middle, and the dark blue one uh, is further down. And you can see that at this stage, when the first shear stress drop appeared, we had a large pore pressure drop. We lose something like seven MPA pore pressure just on that sensor, measured on that sensor. But the one that's not reached by the cloud of acoustic emission, essentially, the the sensor that's in the region is still intact. 
doesn't see as much and he sees like the classic delayed drop in pore pressure because if there's a pore pressure drop in that region it takes time for the fluid to connect and flow from that region to the region where the other sensor is concomitantly to this very small stress drop but large comparatively large pore pressure drop we have a small amount of slips so again small amount of further shortening if you like and that's something about that. this is maybe 20 microns right there's barely anything there and you have this several of these events so i'm showing you two sequence of events so here you have one stress drop and you continue deforming the pore pressure rebounds and re uh, and re homogenizes across the sample and then you have another one another event so this corresponds to this uh, sequence here when you have the dots here so the black dots correspond to this interval and the gray dots are the cumulative uh, events that we located prior to this and you see we have another cloud of activity here that broke a, a region of the fold that's further away from these transducers and you can see that the response fairly slowly here and so we have we have a direct match between uh, the, prog the progress of the fault across the intact truck and the, and the drop in pore pressure and you see that you don't need any slip I mean you need 20 microns of slip to drop the pore pressure by 7 MPA. That's a, that's a huge change. It's a very, very sensitive, uh, sensitive process. So that was the precursor events. When you have the, the fault is only partial, the, 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 the system is not completely broken yet. Now, if I go to the, to the dynamic rupture itself, we still have the cloud of events. So this rupture, I think for that specific example, it took about one second to rupture. So it's far slower than anything you would do when you have six slip. A six slip would be a thousandth of a second. This is a thousand times uh, slower. So we have a very dramatic decrease in, in stress, as, as I documented before, a dramatic decrease in pore pressure in both uh, the sensors, because these are now um, uh, um, positioned along the, the, the full plane. And we see that we complete in the sequence of eight, nine, and 10, we complete the fold very rapidly. So it takes about so uh, yeah, it, it takes uh, like uh, yeah, a fraction of a second, I would say maybe one second for uh, stage 10 to occur, which is where we complete the fault uh, eventually. And concomitantly with the completion of the fault from the intact material, we have a large increase in slip. So then we have a faulty drop. Before it was partially fractured, now it's completely fractured and we can slide. Uh, and then if I plot what happens after, this is where you have the second, the second thing, the, the, the second step is you have this dynamic, you have this stress drop, but then it continues and the stress continues to drop, slip continues to accumulate, pore pressure rebounds, and we have an acoustic emission cloud that's more or less distributed across uh, the, the fold. So now we have completely separated the first stage of fracturing the rock, which, has, which is a massively dilated process with a strong pore pressure drop. Here we lost something like 30 megapascal pore pressure. And at the second stage, immediately following it, we have a, a pore pressure increase, a very slow equivalent, a very slow slip and continued stress drop. So what happens there is that at the time you complete this fault, so if I go back to this, at the time this is, this is completed, you have reached a new equilibrium, right? Because the fault has stopped moving, you've made the fault, right? But the equilibrium corresponds to a very low pore pressure inside the fault. So what it does is that what, uh, outside the fold, the pore pressure is much higher. What you do is you re-inject. So the fold walls are re-injecting, are re-equilibrating the pore pressure inside the sample. And by doing so, it's like an injection test, except it's a self-injection test, if you want, where the pore pressure re-equilibrates within the sample. And by doing that, well, uh, sorry, you relax the shear stress, commensurate uh, in a commensurate way to the pore pressure, and you increase the slip. So one way of looking at this is to plot the slip since failure versus the time since failure. And you can model the entire thing with a very basic spring slider system where you just start from the low pore pressure that you had just at the time of failure, and then you let it relax over time. And you can find that you have an after slip, uh, we call it delta after here, that's commensurate to the peak uh, to the maximum change of pore pressure under undrained conditions. So essentially what you had during failure, which was very short and some kind of diffusion across, uh, across the material. And so uh, we have the data, which is uh, on four different experiments where we saw this effect, where you can see that the slip and uh, the slip uh, continues after failure uh, and it decelerates over time. And this is a model where we don't have any fitting parameter in this model. So this is a prediction. Right? There's nothing here that we fit. Uh, 
uh, we just take whatever undrained pore pressure change we had, and then we plug in reasonable values for the diffusion parameters, which is like essentially hydraulic diffusivity across the font. We know the stiffness of our machine, and we know uh, we know the friction coefficient uh, along the pre along the newly made fault, and that's what we predict. So this is something that tells you that you can have local fluid recharge. So it's a completely local process that promotes after sleep, silent after sleep, immediately following the main shock. So I don't think it sounds. It's, maybe it sounds obvious now, now that I've explained it, but it's something that everyone who's, who's ever done a fluid saturated uh, fracture test in a granite have has seen this, but maybe, maybe never really realized it was like this. Uh, because you have these two, these two stages where there's a strong dilatant effect and then the recharge that promotes this. But again, it happens over like tens of seconds, so you have to be very accurate to measure it. All right. Uh, hi, Nick. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Georg here. Yeah. Short question. Um, I may have missed this, but how do you recharge the fluid to the fault? Do you have a direct access by a bore or does it no, come no, no, from... No, 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 no. So, so this model is just the off fault because the dilatancy was mostly on the fault. Right, and the off fault has not seen that the off fault broke. As it's, but as, the porosity of your vessel like granite is very small, yep. and the permeability is very low. Yeah. So in order to get the fluid from the solid rock pieces into the fault, yeah, that that's not so easy, right? No, but it takes about a minute, so like maybe an hour or so, and you get okay. <laughs> yeah. And again, in, in this, this is this is the diffusivity, hydraulic diffusivity of West Solid Granite. The thing is, porosity mm -hmm. is quite it's quite small, but because porosity is small, permeability is small too, but the diffusivity is not that small actually. So uh, mm -hmm. 10 minus five or something meters square per second. So it's really achievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously here we kind of cheat in our experiments uh, because we have imposed boundary condition with constant pore pressure. So that helps a lot, but that's the, the model does not rely on that for, for this mechanism to occur. Mm -hmm. Just if you have a semi-infinite medium and a fault in it, the, the, the semi-infinite, I mean, the, the off-fault region will recharge into the fault. That's it. Um, Completely local. And of course, the more, I mean, the lower the permeability, the longer it's going to take and so on. So this effect, you would not see that effect if it was like a very porous rock, for instance, because it would instantly recharge or instantly, uh, very quickly uh, recharge. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the experimental aspect of this. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more details I could tell about in terms of the modeling and so on, but I thought, uh, I thought this is probably, this probably was sufficient at that stage, but because again, you're modeling the experiment, which is nice, but what you really want is model the earthquake, right? So the, ex the experiment is not like an earthquake. There's lots of differences. And the main difference, I think, between an experimental setup that we have in a triaxial apparatus and the nat in nature is the size of the, is the size, obviously. Uh, and what the size does is that it allows for elastodynamic or elastostatic uh, redistribution of stresses along the fall that we cannot really capture what well, is it's very hard to capture with this uh, in this structural experiment. It's feasible and it's much, much harder because the rocks are very stiff. So the length scale associated with the elasticity in rocks are quite large compared to the sample size. Now we can we can model this. Again, I'm, I want to do something really simple here because I want to try to capture as much of the physics as possible without uh, com making, too, making it too complex. Uh, so I'm going to take a, an elastic host rock uh, which can conduct fluids. I'm going to start a mode three fracture. Uh, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a sub infinite fault. So we have like a very long fault here. And then I'm going to concentrate on what happens at the tip of this fracture. And so I'm going to assume that the fracture is propagating at some constant rupture speeds, uh, V sub R, and that we have some dilation. So we have uh, some porosity change, which I call delta phi max here, and some compressibility here. So the ratio of porosity change over compressibility would give you the peak. Uh, the maximum change of pore pressure under undrained conditions. And that would occur mostly at the tip of the fracture, as we saw in the lab. This is the very early stages of sleep that all the action happens in terms of changing the porosity and the pore pressure. And of course, we allow the fluid to redistribute uh, across the fault here. So in that context, I'm not going to allow for fluid to, to move along the fault. It's a simplified version of this. There's another a uh, way of doing this where you allow the fluid to, fo to, to, to flow along the fault, but I'm not going to talk about this now because I'm assuming that the distances uh, uh, in, along the fault are much longer, so the gradients are much smaller along the fault than across the fault, which is again kind of uh, uh, reasonable if you look at, at uh, the length scales across the fault are the order of millimeters or things like this, and along the fault you would think of meters or tens of meters. <clears throat> 
for the gradients to occur. So I have a steady propagating rupture. We need to assume some kind of friction law. So here I'm going to take the simplest we can, slip weakening friction, uh, because we understand a lot about this system with slip weakening friction only. Uh, and we also assume that we have a slip dependent dilatancy. So again, more slip means more dilation, which is exactly what we saw in our experiments to first order. Again, there's lots of subtlety there, subtleties there, but I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to take the first order effects here and we allow for free through. And again, the goal of this is to compute an energy balance and a crack equation of motion to, to predict when this is going to go and a speed at which it's going to go. So you can solve this problem. It's an elastic fracture mechanic problem. Uh, 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 it's not. It's a not. It's a non-linear fracture mechanics problem actually, because you have to really handle the tip region accurately. You can't just lump everything into the fracture energy, at least in first approximation. And then this is what you, the, the kind of thing you would predict from this model. So how to read these curves? Here I'm plotting the slip rate and the stress change as a function of position along the crack tip. So you have to pay attention that this position is in log scale. So minus. So ten minus three is literally at the tip. And then this is 10 to the five. So it's really, really far from the tip. And the length scale that normalizes this is some kind of slip weakening length scale, uh, uh, which has elastic constants in it. And so this is, if you have uh, essentially a very high diffusivity, uh, hydraulic diffusivity in that case, or a very slow rupture, or even if you want an, in an extreme case, a dry rupture, like there's no fluids. This is what you would observe. You would observe that as you approach, or you start the fracture, the slip rate peaks and then drops. Uh, and there's just one stress drop. You know, this is just the superconning friction load. There's nothing really crazy happening there. And then if you're really far from the fault, you can really well approximate all the behavior in terms of slip rate and stress as linear elastic fracture mechanics. So this is the prediction that you would say, assuming, well, we don't, we don't care too much about what happens at the tip, but looking from far, we have LEFM, which is a nice prediction here. So that would be the dry rupture. Now, if I put the fluids in, and one way of doing this is say, well, let's say the material is very impermeable or the rupture is very fast. So you don't have any time for the fluid flow to have to happen. You'd predict something like this. So you have also a stress drop that actually it happens in two stages. And it should remind you of what we saw in the experiment It's exactly the same process. Uh, and the slip rate also happens in, 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 in two bursts if you want. So very close to the tip, we have, some, we have a peak in slip rate and a stress drop that completely corresponds to uh, uh, that's completely driven by the slip weakening friction law that we impose in the first place. So that's the dry effect, if you want. Now what happens is that if the rock is really undrained, what you do is you equilibrate everything with the undrained pore pressure change, right? And so the stress or the strength on the fault will be much higher because you have a low pore pressure temporarily. And you need, and in order to weaken further, you need that pore pressure to escape the rock. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, we need that pore pressure to, uh, to re-equilibrate, sorry. So what happens is there, you have like a first stress drop that corresponds to our slip weakening friction law and a very long-term stress drop that can be completely captured by diffusion, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is driven by fluid flow from the off fault into the fault. And then what you see is that, uh, uh, yeah, you have these two this sequence of stress drops which is completely analog to what we saw in the lab where we have the first stress drop and then the second stress drop. Uh, um, and here we have another peak in steps of slip rate, which can also capture with a, an elementary diffusion model here. So again, it makes the crack tip situation a lot more complicated. Uh, now it's complicated, but actually it's not that complicated if you look at it, uh, because you can say, well, if, I'm not, if I don't care too much about what happens there, about these two peaks, and if I say, well, if I'm looking at scales that are much larger, than the scale over which these guys happen, I can just say, well, let's lump everything, every dissipation into some kind of toughness or inner fracture energy. Here we have stress versus position. You can recapture this in terms of stress versus slip. And the stress versus slip curve, you can always integrate that and you know, a, a, arrive at an estimate of the fracture energy for this com complicated process. If you do this, what you find is that here, I put it in terms of the stress intensity factor, which is again, uh, some function of the fracture energy if you want as a function of a non-dimensional thing, which is essentially the hydraulic diffusion time. It's like how long it takes for the fluid to flow in versus how long it takes for the rupture to progress. And so what you can find is that the faster the rupture or the slower the, the fluid flow is, the larger the, 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 uh, the GC, so the more energy you need to put in the system. Because again, you have to work against something that's undrained where the pressure has dropped and there's more strength uh, 
at the tip of the fault here. So to sum, to, to sum it up, you can write this in terms of uh, a strengthening effect that's actually better than strengthening, I would call it toughening effect. So the, the dilatancy here uh, produces an increase in apparent uh, toughness of the shear crack. So obviously here, if it's completely drained, you come back to your toughness, which is the LEFM equivalent toughness, but the more you have, the, the more the pore pressure changes. So this, is, this value corresponds to more porosity change uh, as a function of slip, then the more uh, you see this effect. And the nice thing is that you can capture this with a model where the toughness scales with the square root of the, of the rupture speed. It's something that was predicted by Jim in 1973, uh, uh, in a slightly different uh, model, I would say, with, um, where it didn't really capture the thickness effects. And there's a few things that were not captured by this, but most of it was already there in 1973. Now, another way of looking at it is to say, well, actually, I can maybe separate the two things. I can have like a tip where we have the normal uh, uh, stress drop where everything is undrained, you know, because the tip is fast. So we have an undrained tip uh, where we have the strengthening. And then far from the tip, uh, from, from the from the rupture tip, we have this diffusion thing, but that's much slower, right? So you can really have two scales. We have the tip with some drain, and far from the tip, it's drained, but you know, it's like essentially changing, it's like changing the stress drop over time, right? Because the more the pore pressure re equilibrates, uh, the more the stress is going to drop. So here, if I plot the drain stress across this uh, from the crack tip here to far from the crack tip, the drain stress would be like this. But if you have the pore pressure change due to dilation, the stress is actually much higher. But you see that this occurs over a very small length scale. So maybe I can say, well, actually, that's my, not, that's my toughness. And all this very long tail thing here is just going to be long, large scale re-equilibration of the pore pressure. So the one way of, look, of dealing with this problem is to say, well, uh, we have uh, uh, energy release rates, or in that case, a stress density factor that's going to be matched by an undrained, uh, an undrained toughness plus another term that depends on diffusion here. So if I want to capture this in a, in a dynamic model, so you can run dynamic models for this problem. Um, and the, the black lines here would correspond to snapshots of the shear stress as a function of position along the fault. We have uh, here, in terms of space, time, position, the shear wave speed would be like this. So it's like a very fast wave speed uh, compared to the, 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 the rupture tip advance. The thick lines correspond to the region of the fold that are broken, and the thin lines correspond to the region of the fold that are not broken yet. Uh, and what you find is that uh, you can stabilize the rupture. You see you have a rupture here that propagates at a only a very small fraction of the shear wave speed. And the entire this is completely due to the fact that you have an undrained scenario at the beginning. So you re-equilibrate all the stresses at low pore pressure, and then over time, pore pressure diffuses back in the fold. And then it's like an injection test, except it's a self-injection test. It's just local re-equilibration. The nice thing with that is that this is the, all these black lines are the dynamic rupture simulations. And this blue line is a, is a prediction based on ADFM. So it's completely pre pre predicting uh, uh, the, the dynamic simulation with a very, very similar equation of motion for the crack tip, which is essentially saying G equals GC. And you can, if, you, if you write your G and GC smartly, you can really match this uh, almost exactly. So in, in that scenario, you can see how uh, a rupture propagation can be transiently limited by, uh, 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 by pore pressure availability in the fault. So that's it for the upscaling. So again, it's a, it's a bit of a weird upscaling. It's more like a theoretical approach. But then it, it tells you that by doing a bit of fracture mechanics based on these experimental observations, you can really get, uh, access to a, a way of seeing the rupture in an integrated way where you have an equilibrium between elastic energy available and dissipation in the fault, where now we have a much closer, we have had a much closer look at the details of the dissipation along this fault, uh, from the slip weakening uh, mechanism to the uh, pore pressure equilibration uh, along the fault here. So to conclude, uh, I've showed you direct evidence for localized pore pressure drops of the order of tens of megapascals due to the passage of the rupture tip. Uh, we have seen the potential for free vaporization in tight rocks, direct evidence in the lab. We have direct evidence for dilatancy stabilization of rupture. Uh, and we have also evidence for after slip driven by local pore pressure redistribution. A nice uh, side effect of this uh, is that we have direct, not direct, this is indirect now. We have an experimental estimate of a quantity that we really need to, to go from pore volume changes to pore pressure changes and that's the fault compressibility. 
Uh, here, I capture it in terms of the fault width times some uh, compressibility factor. So it's measured in terms of meters uh, per Pascal. And so we have this value. So it sounds like nothing, but this is a very hard value to measure. And uh, you, it's very hard to measure if you don't have access directly to the pore pressure inside the fault under in situ dynamic conditions. And so this is, again, this is, this, uh, this is not, I mean, uh, we have these new measurements, but this directly confirms previously untested predictions. So there was a paper by Rinicki and Chen, you can, you can testify in 1988, where, where there's a sentence, I should have uh, copied it, I should have shown you the screenshot of the text, where there's a sentence that if you run these models where you have dilation, you end up very quickly into the regime where you have uh, vaporization of fluids. And you know this is very hard to test, right? And now we have a direct test of this. Uh, and again, also before people had, had, had uh, tried to test this kind of stabilization of rupture, but it was also quite indirect, right? Because you had to rely on external measurements. Okay, the fault is slower now, but what's actually happening in detail, you didn't know. Uh, uh, and again, I also want to point out that in parallel, when I was doing this in 19, when 2018, 19, and 2020, when the first paper of this series came out, in parallel, the Brooks Porter, Liv Lochner, and, other, and others, Tom Mitchell at the USGS, they're also doing something quite similar where they were not doing intact rocks, but doing saw cuts and full gouge, but also saw very, very similar processes where we, they, 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 would, they would demonstrate there's very strong control of fluid pressure variations on, on the dynamics of slip in saw cuts and full gouge. So it's very nicely complementary between what we did here in the intact rocks or newly formed faults and more like mature faults where you have saw cuts or, or gouge. We have direct evidence of large fluctuation in fluid pressure during rupture. So it's kind of nice because it's a, it's a long standing hypothesis for, uh, for, the, um, uh, uh, for the, the operation of hydrothermal systems in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in compressive environments. So there's a long series of papers by Rick Zipson in the 70s and 80s about these type of things. Um, we have also direct experimental evidence, I would say, for the fact that we have slow sleep events. So again, this is a particular type of slow sleep event, but nonetheless, it is one that's directly measured and that's directly attributable to dilation. So there's no other effects, right? Uh, I don't, that, you don't need to call to rate and state effects there because the dominant effect in an intact truck is the loss of cohesion and it's not the small variations of friction coefficient due to A and B parameters here. Uh, and then something I, I, we recently uh, realized with, when working with this with France is that we have this after sleep, but actually it's a very particular type of after sleep. And I guess maybe if the seismologist there or geodesist there, we can, we can discuss about this. We have after slip that's collocated with the main rupture because we have the main rupture that slipped and that's where the dilation happens. And then it's the, it's the for, for, for pressure recharge of that region and the slip happens on that same region. And I think this is not very easy to get in, in conventional models of after slip. You always get the after slip where you have the stress transfer or, some, or things like this. But here we have a, a new mechanism for after sleep. I'm not saying this is universal. I'm not saying every after sleep is like this, but it's maybe something we can start to look at when we have this very rapid time series of, of after sleep measured after large events. So here I pulled out one of the many recent papers on this, uh, where people uh, did very, very rapid time series with continuous GPS and things like this uh, on, on after sleep after main, main shocks. And they saw regions of, so this was in uh, San Andreas fault, because of course, why not? Uh, um, uh, you see that you have seismic sleep also in the same location where you had seismic sleep. And this, this uh, may be not easy to, uh, to get in conventional models. Again, I'm not saying the, the mechanism we highlighted there is universal, but, um, but clearly we should, maybe we should look for it in some specific regions where we think this may have happened. And then just to finish off, I have one slide with uh, some perspectives, what we are doing right now in the lab. Uh, again, the fact that we have these neutron juices, it opens so many new possibilities in the lab. Uh, and so we've worked together with Tom and Phil and my student Bobby, um, new postdoc here, Dong Liu, where we start to look at pore elastic effects, uh, where we can measure directly undrained quantities like Skempton parameters, which are again, really hard to measure in, in, in conventional systems. And just to give you a quick teaser of what may come, I hope this year, if I can finish writing those papers, is that in, 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 in granites or in tight rocks at high loads, Skempton coefficients can be negative in different directions. You get lots of anisotropy 
in Skempton, F in Skempton coefficients because you, you generate oriented microcracks and so on. And then you can get negative Skemp Skempton coefficients, which means that when the stress is dropping, the pore pressure is increasing. And I think that's quite interesting to think about these effects. So we have, so this is just one plot from Bobby's thesis uh, where he did this very uh, systematic measurements in, in this was rusted granite, by the way, uh, with the radial Skempton F coefficient and the actual Skempton coefficient. And you see that if you go to high loads, Skempton coefficient in the actual direction becomes negative. So there's lots of implications to that. And this is what we're working on at the moment. And to finish off, just a list of recent papers. Uh, if you go to my website, that would be here, uh, relevant to these topics. So starting 2020 and then onwards. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>